Well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, everybody here from uh, Germany. My name is Alexander Kirsten. I'm uh, running the ICU uh, for cardiology, pneumonology in the University of Berlin, Aachen. And I'm here to talk to you about hemocrofusion and sepsis. And I'm going to give you an overview of current evidence and practice. Um, these are my conflicts of interest, and uh, none of them have anything to do with what I'm going to tell you about today. Um, and uh, just to get everybody on the same page, what are we talking about? We're talking about sepsis, uh, septic patients. And of course, sepsis three showed us that sepsis is the dysregulated host response. What does that mean? It means infection goes bad. You see that down here. And when infection goes bad, you become septic and um, have organ dysfunction. And here have the subgroup of patients in septic shock who don't just only have organ dysfunction, but also have microvascular uh, disarrangement microvascular problems. And that's uh, a bit different from the old SIRS sepsis definition. And we all know that what makes the infection go bad is, um, as far as the host response is concerned, is the cytokine storm, the reaction to dams and PAMs. Um, and we know all that for a couple of years now. So sepsis is the life-threatening organ dysfunction due to a dysregulated host response to an infection. It is not the regulated host response that characterizes the adequate non-septic reaction to infection. And this is what happens. You get patients who have this inadequate immune reaction, inadequate host response, and they go into multi-organ dysfunction. You can have some patients who have post-infectious immune status um, that is reduced um, also with, uh, you know, uh, out of homeostasis and you get secondary infections with later multi-organ dysfunction. And um, if we're talking about hemoperfusion, one of the goals might be to create a normal immune reaction to create homeostasis, and that might be helpful. Um, and we, just to get the background, we have seen trials um, from different per producers of um, hemoperfusion devices like the Cytosorb RCT2 um, uh, that ran from April 2008 to June 2011, 580 patients screened. Um, and you see only uh, very few, around 100 included. These were patients that were severely sick on mechanical ventilation in septic shock with ARDS. And the tr um, trial um, was, was aiming at including patients within 72 hours um, after the diagnosis. So 72 hours is of course three days and you might question whether that is a bit too late. Um, also the trial ran for a long time. So obviously even though they screen, they had problems enrolling patients, I would assume. Um, patients were then treated with cytokine absorptions for six hours up to seven days in a combination with CRT mostly or alone. And um, the main outcome was normalized IL-6 between those time points. And this is what happens. You have patients who have an increased IL-6 around 500 to 600 um, uh, um, uh, on, uh, in mean. Um, and we'll uh, discuss this later. And you see that there's no difference in the curve for IL-6 development, whether you are treated with cytokine removal or not. So obviously treating the underlying infection also does something for your cytokines, we know that. Um, and there was no benefit in treating these patients with cytokine removal. It did not um, lead to a quicker resolution of your increased IL-6 serum levels. Um, therefore it is um, a negative trial. Um, one point is IL-6 is quite overall low, um, and uh, um, I, I would uh, open for discussion. Would be open for discussion whether a patient with an IL-6 of 500 actually needs cytokine removal. It is it is not normal, but we see patients who have much higher cytokine levels. Um, the elimination work there was between five and 18 percent per blood pass, um, so that is also. Um, maybe question the efficacy of that device. Um, and actually we did have an unadjusted higher mortality in the treatment group. Um, however, in the treatment group, you had higher rates of renal replacement therapy. So that's a bit uh, hard to interpret. Overall, for the primary endpoint, the trial is negative. Um, there is HA data, um, the device Jaffron produces, HA330 data. Um, this is a trial by Wang um, and colleagues um, in Guangzhou. Um, they had patients with acute in lung injury um, due to extra pulmonary sepsis, so basically abdominal sepsis uh, leading to acute lung injury, who had organ dysfunction requiring ICU admission. 25 patients were with cytokine removal, 21 controls. They looked at a bunch of outcomes, cytokines, patchy scores, 
um, hemodynamic and uh, pulmonary functional measures, um, as well as ICU and 28 days mortality, length of stay, and time on the ventilator. Um, and this data um, suggests that uh, you do see a benefit. Um, um, patients here were evenly distributed, um, and there was no difference in the severity of patients disordered or characteristics. Um, however, the patients treated with cytokine removal did better. They had less IL-1 in their uh, alveolar fluid, less TNF-alpha, uh, less plasma IL-1, and less plasma TNF-alpha. So there you see a large difference in this patient population, uh, whether you get treated with cytokine removal or not. And this difference in cytokine um, amount um, uh, is, is, is translated into differences in um, measures of critical care illness and critical care treatment. So patients were uh, spent less time on the ventilator, um, spent less uh, time on dialysis, uh, spent less time overall in the ICU, uh, had a trend to less ICU mortality and 28 day mortality, and had less so far scores or, or, or lower so far scores at day 14. Um, so this is quite um, intriguing data. Um, one has to, of course, a question that you have very large differences in a very small sample size um, that opens a, a trial like that to the question of what well, maybe was there some bias um, and uh, uh, as always, uh, the result of a discussion like that is you need larger trials observational and randomized to um, actually prove that this is not just um, a single center effect with some bias. In it. Um, so this is the scientific background, and you see those are only those, those are only like three or four slides. So there is not much um, in regards to observational or randomized trials. There are tons of um, reports. There are tons of case reports and maybe some small case series. But the um, high quality trial world uh, for hemoperfusion is still lacking a bit. Um, what are we talking about? We are talking about absorption on ECMO or absorption on CRT and how does that work? Um, and um, I assume most of the viewers and listeners are uh, somewhat uh, proficient in hemoperfusion. This is how our center does it and um, uh, most centers do it in a similar way. Um, for example, if a patient is on VV ECMO like this, we have uh, uh, the venous drainage cannula, the blood goes into the ECMO and then you can put the uh, hemoperfusion device in line with um, um, uh, in, in parallel with the oxygenator, so that you get kind of a um, of course bypass uh, of oxygenated blood um, uh, back and forth, and you run um, uh, ECMO blood through the hemoperfusion filter. Um, what does that lead to? Well, um, it, it leads to a lot of blood going through. Usually, if an ECMO blood flow of between four and six liters during the septic phase, maybe three liters to four liters during the non-septic phase, but we're talking about a septic patient here. Um, <clears throat> and the way we do it, excuse me, is that we don't use extra heparin uh, because the patient usually has heparin, he's on ECMO. Um, so usually they do have an ACT of 170, 180, <coughs> excuse me, 190. Um, uh, and you end up with a blood flow around 10%. We did some early measurements on that if it is hooked up. Um, uh, along this ECMO circuit. So four liters lead to probably 400 ml um, of uh, blood flow through the um, uh, um, uh, Jeffron um, HA330 or 380. Um, this is what it would look like. You can see that the uh, setting might look a bit experimental, but however, this is uh, just, you know, uh, you need to attach it and there are some um, arms you can attach it to, or you can just use these binders. Um, it's quite easy. Excuse me, didn't want to go that fast. It's quite easy and you get a lot of blood going through and you probably have high efficacy um, uh, in, in a very short time in this very sick patient population. Maybe you know, again, we're talking about a patient who's in lung failure on ECMO in sepsis. So uh, usually these patients are in renal failure most of the time also. So we're talking about two to three organs failing. Um, absorption on CRT um, is more common. I would, I would say, and it's also easier because ECMO is a very complicated device and it's a very dangerous device. You have to be, uh, be proficient in what you do, um, but usually any ICU uh, around the world can put people on CRRT devices. And um, we use CVVH or CVVHD 
um, we use different kinds of uh, machines from uh, the most uh, common producers like uh, Gambro or uh, Fresenius. And usually we put um, the um, a cytokine absorber in line. So um, this is the dialysis filter. And we just put it in line with the dialysis. Um, and you could have put it post or pre uh, filter. There are pros and cons for each side. Um, and yeah, this is a post uh, uh, CVVH filter setup um, uh, with the Presenius machines. We usually do a pre CVHD um, uh, filter setup, but uh, that's just um, uh, maybe up to personal taste. And the, the, the setting is quite easy. You have your dialysis catheter, blood goes in, goes through the dialysis membrane, uh, and then the cytokine absorber. It's, it's very easy. Um, again, you have to talk about anticoagulation. For my center, uh, we don't use heparin in this setting um, because we have all patients uh, on regional citrate anticoagulation. So the blood going through the HA380 in this setting is um, uh, exposed to citrate and there's no clotting in this circuit. And we have blood flows of at least 150 ml per minute. Um, the maximum blood flow is around 200 ml per minute in, uh, with most CVHD machines. Um, so you have a reasonable amount of blood going through and this works just very fine and uh, is very easy to set up and can be done basically on any CRT machine. Um, and this is what it would look like. You have your um, uh, device like this or your device like this, dialysis filter, dialysis filter, and the cytokine absorber just um, in line with your dialysis machine. And these machines are not bothered by this. The flow resistance of uh, uh, the cytokine absorber is so low that it's, uh, uh, it works like a charm. Um, when you prepare it, well, you have to prime it. And that's uh, really independent of whether you use an ECMO or use a dialysis machine, use a CRT device. We prime using crystalloids, um, two to three liters over 15 to 20 minutes. And again, usually prime without heparin um, because either the patient is completely on fully heparin if he's on ECMO and coagulation is already messed up usually like that anyways. Um, and uh, if we put it into a citrated uh, um, circuit on a dialysis machine, again, we use, don't use heparin in priming um, as well. Um, this is a, a short view into some of the patients um, we evaluated first uh, a, a while ago. Um, I talked about in the beginning about the mean um, IL-6 level in the Cytosorb trial, uh, Cytosorb 2 trial, um, being around 500. And these are the patients we usually see where we think about cytokine removal. And you can see their IL-6 levels, are, uh, 1800 is one of the lowest, I think, um, and it goes up to more than 250,000 picogram per ml. Um, so IL-6 is markedly increased, um, as is IL-8, as is IL-10, as is TNF-alpha, as is soluble IL-2, as is PCT. And um, looking at this case series from my center, these patients are all very acidotic. They have high lactate levels. This is millimole per liters. Um, they are on high doses of vasopressors. So these are in severe shock. And those are all patients that are not responding to the primary therapy after a couple of hours. And these went uh, on absorption therapy on CRT or ECMO. And this is what we then, when then saw. We saw clear trends to improvement in markers of shock. So this is a logarithmic scale, please be aware. Um, um, the markers of shock go down, lactate drops in uh, many patients. In some it doesn't, and those actually end up dying. Uh, so you, you do see that this uh, failing to improve with maximum therapy is of course not, not, not good. And uh, these patients deteriorate within the next couple of hours. Um, uh, norepinephrine doses go down. Again, logarithmic scale, um, they go down by a uh, multiple fold in most patients. In some, you have a rebound. In some, like this patient, um, there is no effect. So obviously, this patient is so sick, your treatment is probably futile anyways. Um, so that's uh, um, uh, a main goal. We see a trend to improvement of markers of shock. And that's what you want. You want your patient to survive, of course, but you use the device not so to improve 28 day or six month survival. You use a device to improve the shock, to have faster shock resolution, hoping that that will translate to better survival in the long run. Um, this was uh, the cytokine 
um, levels we detected in patient serum. So SIL2, IL6, IL10, IL8 is what we can measure easily. Again, logarithmic scale. And you can see for SIL2, um, not that much uh, of a change in the majority of patients. Large changes in, SI, in IL6. And um, of course, IL6 being a very easily measurable marker of cytokine storm. Um, some changes in IL-8, and you can also see some changes in IL-10 um, uh, going down in the majority of patients. Um, we also measured TNF-alpha, and even though the absolute changes are not as pronounced, you see a um, clear picture of TNF-alpha dropping in many of the patients or staying flat, and uh, except for this one patient, number 15 here. Um, so uh, we get an idea of what's happened, what's happening in this critically ill patient population. We saw a strong signal for IL-6 reduction. Um, drop in IL-6 is uh, very significantly different between those that ended up surviving and non-surviving. Um, in some patients, however, it increased during treatment, obviously bad. And in some patients, you saw a rebound after treatment. And we're not quite sure what to do with that because it doesn't necessarily translate into dying. Um, there's a reduction in TNF-alpha, and that was most pronounced, and it stayed statistically the most stable. Um, there were no statistically significant signals in this small cohort of ours for IL-2, 8, and 10. Um, however, if we look at what's actually being eliminated, uh, those rates vary wildly from 11 to 83, 6 to 65, 3 to 48, for IL-6, IL-10, and TNF-alpha. So, um, on a patient individual base, you get very different results in what you're actually removing. And, and also, that is probably not completely understood since the device just works on the basis of concentrations. You're just, you know, leveling out concentrations between blood and the absorber. Um, we also did some, uh, uh, looked at some data for IL-6 in patients uh, with hemoperfusion in during the COVID-19 uh, first wave in 2020. Um, and we see uh, um, a picture that we, we're not really quite sure. So these patients, um, uh, those are the ones that survived with IL-6 before and after HA380. Um, due to the strain on our ICU, we could not do the, the two hourly measurements we did in the first patient wave there. Um, and you see most of the patients drop um, um, with this treatment um, uh, if they survive. Uh, but they also do the if they if they die. So um, um, we're not quite sure. And you can see um, IL-6 is increased uh, markedly in some, um, slightly or, or moderately in, 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 in some of them. Um, so we're not quite sure. We can only show that uh, it does work in patients who are septic and have COVID-19 as the underlying disease. Um, and, and whether this IL-6 level is solely due to viral infection, or if it's maybe due to bacterial superinfection, we don't know. I would assume many of them have bacterial superinfection um, and not just viral infection because for patients without that, IL-6 levels are usually much lower. If you look at the trials in COVID-19 for tocilizumab, for example. Um, so how does this all work? So I've shown you now the scientific breakdown that's been done other, in other places. I've shown you some of the preliminary or, or initial data we did, uh, how does this work? Well, basically, um, you're removing stuff out of your blood. Uh, hemodialysis does this too. Um, between zero and around maybe 25 kilo del Dalton, you get hemodialysis and hemofiltration, and you remove, um, you know, all, all the uh, stuff your kidneys doesn't, don't remove anymore. And, and some of this hemoperfusion has a different range. You're talking uh, usually around 10 to 60, 65. Um, um, a kilo Dalton of molecular weight. And you can see all the things that fall in this range. And, and there, those are things that um, you might need, you might not need, you might have an excess of, or you might have too little of. So you have to be aware that you're removing um, in a broad range and you're removing um, con in a concentration dependent manner. Um, IL-8, IL-13, IL-4 is here, IL-1-RA and IL-1-A, IL-6. Um, um, is here um, uh, at the end of this range, there's also albumin, which you probably don't want to remove. There's free hemoglobin, which you um, uh, might want to remove in certain situations like um, hemolysis and ECMO. Um, and so it's a broad, broad range. Uh, TNF alpha is here. Um, and this is the range of what work. Um, there are some pitfalls to using this adsorption therapy because um, 
you know what you're potentially removing. You don't really know what you're specifically removing because you would have to measure it in the patient blood in a, in a very con concise and precise manner. You would have to measure it um, in the blood uh, right after the um, hemoperfusion device, after the um, HA380, for example. Um, so you don't really know what you're moving specifically in, in all the cases. Um, and also these patients are usually so sick that unwanted side effects of the absorption treatment might be overlooked because they are so sick and they have so many confounding factors. You know, many things can happen in somebody who's critically ill. Um, so you must have, if you use this uh, therapy, you must be aware that there could be um, adverse events and you should take note of them. Um, what are the possible adverse events you can um, expect to see? Um, bleeding is one, clotting is another one, and increasing of present coagulation disturbances is another one. Um, you could see leukopenia. You can remove and alter drugs that you might want to have in the patients. Uh, um, remember, these um, uh, devices can also be used in, in, in certain situations where patients are intoxicated. Um, however, most of the drugs we uh, have in the ICU, we want inside of our patients. We don't actually want to remove, especially anti-infective drugs. Um, and that's a a uh, major concern in septic patients that you remove the antibiotics or antifungal or antiviral uh, drugs. Um, so you should be uh, considering drug monitoring whenever possible. You must uh, ensure adequate drug levels in patients who have an enlarged uh, um, uh, third space, who have um, plasma expansion due to volume resuscitation, who have an enlarged um, uh, um, distributive um, uh, volume because of being on ECMO and CRT, for example, uh, do have um, increased capillary leak um, and uh, losing drugs into the third um, space. So you have to be aware of that. Um, also, you can uh, potentially, as I mentioned, remove albumin and you can remove, remove nutrients, which is um, harmful on the long run. You can change electrolyte levels. So there are some pitfalls you should take note of. Um, there is in vitro data um, for unwanted absorption on the HA380, for example. Um, so you do see some uh, antibiotics are more prone to being removed than others. Uh, piperacillin, linozolid, claritomycin, ampicillin, vancomycin, tigacillin, uh, meropenem um, to, a, to a lesser degree. Um, uh, immunosuppressors are usually not removed in a, um, a relevant manner. Uh, however, you have to be aware the device can absorb some of the things that you actually want to have or keep inside of your patient. There is some scientific data um, uh, in vivo as well. Um, uh, this is just one example, one of the more recent one from 2019 from Park et al. They looked at patients who underwent um, uh, hemoperfusion due to intoxication uh, with pesticides. Um, this was done using a coated charcoal absorber. And you do see that there's an effect on white blood cells, there's an effect on hemoglobin, there's an effect on platelets. Um, from going from 250 to around 150 uh, platelet distribution width, um, volume, and um, a platelet uh, basically efficacy um, in, in, in uh, uh, triggering coagulation. Um, all this is altered. Um, however, uh, these are sick patients, not the sickest of the sick, but they're sick enough. Whether a drop in hemoglobin from 13 to around 12 it's clinically relevant in this patient population, I think needs to be discussed. I would say it's not. Whether a drop of platelets from 250 to 150 is clinically relevant, even though I can measure it, also is an area of debate. And uh, in many cases in an ICU, you would take note of it, but as long as the patient doesn't start bleeding um, or is clotting um, in the form of a disseminated intravascular coagulation, you don't really, Thing but observe the drop in platelets from 250 to 150 and you don't need to intervene. So there's always the distinction, uh, you need to distinguish between monitoring something and actually having to intervene between just measuring something and having something clinically relevant. Um, this is a side effect, but it's probably for most of the patients not clinically relevant in this setting. Um, oops, this is a bit uh, fast, I'm sorry, uh, uh, this animation. So what trigger side effects? Um, uh, there are patient intrinsic factors. The degree of inflammation, of course, sepsis is there. Um, uh, and there are uh, um, side effects that are uh, uh, basically triggered by the device you're using. So what kind of device are you using? How much blood flow do you have? In, in, how long do you keep somebody on the device? 
um, what's your anticoagulation, your prime link. Um, these are all um, side effects and you have patient intrinsic and you have device intrinsic side effects and you have to maybe split those apart. Um, the problem is that in the, the sicker your patient is, the sicker the patient is you treat with hemoperfusion, the more of these side effects you actually see um, even if you don't use hemoperfusion. So thrombopenia is very common in patients that actually are considered for hemoperfusion because they are septic, they might have DIC, they might be thrombocytopenic due to other reasons. Um, some degree independent of hemoperfusion, some may, it may be aggravated. Um, then again, is the question, is it clinically relevant? Um, and maybe it is clinically relevant if there's also loss of fibrinogen and antithrombin-3 um, also, which can be also altered due to hemoperfusion. Um, there is the question of loss of anti-effective agents and albumin. And again, you can have high, severe hypo, uh, hypoalbuminemia in patients who are not on hemoperfusion, who are just septic and have severe capillary leak and who have undergone um, um, strong volume resuscitation. So um, again, you see these things independent of hemoperfusion and you just maybe cannot be sure that it's hemoperfusion causing this side effect or it's the underlying disease. Um, Sometimes if a patient is on ECMO and CRT, you don't really know which device is causing what. Um, I mean, an ECMO can cause all of these things by itself. A CRT, to a lesser degree, can cause most of these things by itself. If you combine the two, you might have aggravated effects. If you combine any of the two with hemoperfusion, you might have an aggravation of these effects. Nobody really knows um, for sure in the um, setting of these severely sick patients. Um, in, and sometimes you may do, it might do harm. Sometimes you have good intentions, it might do harm. Um, this is a, a very recent trial, a trial in Lancet Respiratory um, from Germany, Supadi et al. They looked at patients with ECMO due to COVID-19. Um, 17 were received cytokine absorption, 17 without cytokine absorption, they used the cytosorb device, um, and they included 16 in the analysis. Um, this is the um, basically table one uh, for this patient uh, group. They're, they're all very sick, severe, um, se severe ARDS. Um, uh, indication for ECMO is completely clear. Um, they're not that septic, so arterial lactate is 1.8. Um, they're not that acidotic, 7.3, 7.28, everything all within range and all reasonable. Um, uh, they don't have that much of IL-6 derangement. Um, so their antileukine sticks after 72 hours is around 100 and, and 112 in the control who do, do not undergo cytokine removal. Um, there are hardly any differences in other endpoints. There is uh, basically no endpoint in, you know, no change in, in uh, uh, intensive care unit and ECMO treatment endpoints. However, there is a trend to higher mortality in the patients being treated with hemoperfusion. So this is the IL-6 concentration. You see this is basically similar whether you get cytokine removal in this um, uh, cohort or not. Um, cytokine absorption here, no cytokine absorption here after 72 hours. After 72 hours, um, patients move into a generally same direction. Um, and again, uh, there is a trend to dying faster and dying in a larger amount if you are on cytokine removal in this specific patient cohort. Um, and that is, of course, worse. Why do patients die more often if they get an additional device with a good intention? Um, this is a small group of patients, but still there is a signal. Um, and we don't really know what to do that. So COVID-19 plus ECMO plus hemoperfusion with cytosorb, there is no survival benefit in this specific patient population. There is potential harm. It's a small sample. You have to question whether that is the correct patient population. Um, does ECMO cause additional harm that needs to be addressed by hemoperfusion in this patient population is uh, the question because that was the, the, the intention to treat. The intention to treat these patients was, well, I want to ameliorate um, additional harm that's maybe done um, to these patients already undergoing inflammation due to COVID that um, inflammation being caused by ECMO. And maybe that is not the case in this patient population. Um, also, it might question whether systemic IL-6 is a good marker for local hyperinflammation. We know that um, patients with COVID-19 have hyperinflammation in their lung, um, but is IL-6 the right marker? We probably it isn't. Um, and also there's this low event rate overall um, uh, in this uh, uh, trial that makes you question the validity of the results. So um, a lot of things to consider. Where do we go from here? And these are my last couple of slides. We don't think we'll cause harm in our groups that we examined. 
and in most other groups like uh, uh, the Chinese data um, uh, in these 25 patients with ARDS uh, didn't definitely not show harm. Um, we have found that uh, markers of shock tend to get better. Cytokine patterns can be inconclusive and we probably don't know in some patients and, and some time points what we're measuring and if it's the right thing. Um, so we are stuck with the questions, how would you identify patients who benefit most? It's definitely not PCT. Um, is it IL-6? Is it TN-alpha? Probably it is. And you must always keep in mind that the first goal of hemoperfusion is to ameliorate shock and avoid uh, organ failure or, or avoid an increase in organ failure. And uh, in the long run, you want uh, to hope that this independently affects mortality, but right now that remains unclear. And it must be further studied to know the exact population to treat. Um, this is, and again, oops, this is a bit fast. Um, this is the reason why we have uh, a trial. Um, this is uh, my, a trial that I run as a PI. It's the Outcast trial. It's an observational trial for 100 patients. It's multi-center. Um, we are including patients with sepsis and at least uh, two organs not functioning um, who have an established need of CRT or ECMO and who have an established need of being treated with hemoperfusion. So these patients are sick and septic and we want to treat them with hemoperfusion. And then we observe what happens during the hemoperfusion treatment. It started last year. We're planning for two and a half years of uh, running this trial, um, including patients for over 24 months with a three-month follow-up. Um, what do we do? Well, our uh, standard of treatment for hemoperfusion is two times eight hours, and we are um, putting an in-between four-hour pause. Um, and we want to make sure we, do, we avoid saturation of the HA380. That's why we switch it, and we agreed on this four-hour uh, pause for this trial because we want to have a short phase where we can potentially measure some rebound. Um, uh, we don't want this phase to be too long because it might uh, harm patients if a rebound is very long. Within four hours, we are quite confident that uh, any rebound should not lead to um, a severe deterioration of your patient. So this is the trial design. We have some endpoints and we're looking at cytokine variability, IL-6, IL-8, IL-10 and TNF-alpha. We have a lot of secondary things we're going to look at, uh, cellular function, the efficacy of the device, the change in vasopressor dose and lactate, changes in PF, SOFA score changes and total SOFA score changes because, again, the main goal is to ameliorate organ dysfunction or to avoid organs from actually deteriorating. Changes in antibiotic drug levels. Um, uh, we try to look at that. Ventilator-free days, an ICU author length of stays, and 30 and 90-day mortality. Um, this trial is running. Uh, this is what the ECRF items look like, you know, the, our uh, measuring uh, stuff every two hours um, um, during the treatment, um, at the end of the treatment, and then we follow with so far course scores and so forth of, uh, for the first week in the ICU. We don't follow them any further because, uh, well, um, what happens in week two or three um, is probably a bit independent of what happened in week one, if your patient actually got better. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure um, uh, how you could uh, address that. And uh, that's why we follow them up to a day, day seven. And then we do a long-term follow-up for their survival status and um, uh, location. So a lot of uh, data that we are gathering. Um, we are recruiting in Aachen. Um, we have 16 patients included. We're initiating German, Chinese, and Belgian hospitals. So it's an international trial that we are putting together. Um, uh, the CRF is uh, on a web portal. So it's a web-based uh, electronic design and you can enter patients here. Um, uh, if, you're a, um, if you are a trial center and you see these visits and the data entry, this is what one of the uh, sheets would look like for exactly so far score, for example. So it's a very standard format of entering data. Um, this is what vasopressors, for example, would look like. And you can see that it's um, quite self-explanatory. So I'm coming to the end of my talk. Um, what can you take away from this? Well, if I would have to put it like this on one slide in a couple of sentences, then I would say hemoperfusion is promising, maybe very promising, but the who, when, and how long remains not completely clear. We have a lot of things to, to gather um, uh, to be smarter and to treat the right patients at the right time for the right amount of time. Um, some patients, as we have seen, might be harmed. So we have to exactly identify those that might be harmed um, and avoid treating those with hemoperfusion. Side effects must be studied because as I've shown, um, uh, some of the side effects uh, are already present even if you don't use hemoperfusion because your patients are sick. Um, the procedure itself is absolutely not complicated. 
Um, you have to think about anticoagulation. That depends on the setting you're using it in. You have to think about the priming of the device. Again, that depends on what setting you're using it in. Um, you have to think about what's the measure of effect. So if we talk in, on a scientific basis for, about hemoperfusion, what is the measure of effect? Is it so far? Is it um, cytokines? Is it the function of your immune system, like monocyte functions? Um, there's still a long road ahead of us to actually find the answer for that. So trials are important um, to get to know as much as we can about this technology, even if this is already a technology that is ubiquitously available, readily available at any bedside in any ICU all over the world. And I, with that, I thank you for your um, attention and I'd be ready to take any question you might have. Thank you. Ah, do, you, do I adjust antibiotic doses or just as normal? That is um, a very good question, a very good question. Um, so I would answer that um, into the way that uh, I would like to have drug level monitoring on everything I give to my patient um, regarding anti-infective drugs. I have drug level monitoring for some. Um, the usual like immunoglycosides, vancomycin and stuff, um, we can measure um, uh, some of the gram-positive active um, uh, antibiotics. We have a, uh, I could probably measure, um, uh, or I can measure meropenem and piperacillin and stuff like that. However, the turnaround time for measuring is very long, so it would not help me clinically because I, I measure it and then I get a result like five days later. And for critical care, that is basically useless. Um, so our approach is to give a maximum dose of antibiotics um, whenever possible, and usually it is possible. So we always dose to the max, um, which mean for which would mean for meropenem, for example, you give uh, three to four times daily two grams, um, and uh, we do that in most patients, um, yeah, unless they're very small or very thin. Um, we definitely do it on patients uh, for patients on ECMO. We definitely, or most of the time, do completely uh, high and, and maximum doses also on CRT. And then we reduce if we see unwanted side effects like uh, um, um, liver enzymes going up, um, for example. Um, so yes, we adjust antibiotics, but we adjust it in most of the patients in the ICU. We pay special, um, um, uh, we, we pay, um, uh, we, we look especially into those patients on CRT um, ECMO, who are then maybe put on hemoperfusion, that they have the maximum uh, antibiotic dose. We don't go above that. Um, as, I shown, as I've shown, we are trying to measure um, antibiotic doses and removal of antibiotic uh, um, levels uh, with hemoperfusion in the patient population we're studying. And if we would find that, the, the, that we're underdosing, um, then you would have to probably change that practice. Uh, for example, one good example is linozolite. Yeah, I'd show, I've shown you that it, it's potentially removed by hemoperfusion. Um, there, um, a, a German um, hospital, a university hospital, is uh, able to measure that with a daily turnaround time right now. And they found that with the usual dose of two times 600 milligrams per day, um, they are actually underdosing by far their ICU population. So they've doubled the dose and we've done that too. Um, so maybe you're underdosing most of your ICU population despite or regardless of whether they're on hemoperfusion. Um, but it's, uh, that's, that's our approach. Next question, do you consider longer treatment with HA um, more than two cartridges for eight hours? Um, within the trial, no. Within the trial, we want to have um, a homogenous um, treatment. We want to have a homogenous group to um, basically keep all of this comparable. Um, individually outside of a trial, Yes, we consider that based on clinical improvement of the patient, so resolution of markers of shock, lactate clearance, and also um, IL-6 um, removal. Um, let's say our patient started out with an IL-6 of 10,000, and after um, two treatment uh, sessions of eight hours each, he's still at 5,000, and he's not getting better, we would discuss it. Um, whether that is actually beneficial remains to be seen, because all the data we have actually shows that IL-6 will drop regardless of um, hemoperfusion in most patients um, just by treating sepsis, excuse me, by treating sepsis and the underlying cause of the disease. 
Um, have I seen beneficial sex on hotel rates in your trial? Well, we haven't done any um, intermittent analysis yet, so I cannot answer that question. Um, how's the blood flow rate when connecting CRT, HA? Can it be over 300 ml per minute? Well, you're basically limited by your dialysis machine um, and, um, uh, and by your uh, venous access. Um, and uh, if you, of course, um, the like Fresenius machines we use can go up to 400 ml per minute. Um, I'm not sure I would want to have a patient on CRT with 400 ml per minute of uh, dialysis blood flow. That would mean like eight liters per hour of uh, dialysis filtrate uh, so, uh, uh, solution. Um, so we'd probably be over dialysing the patient by, uh, by and large. Um, and I wouldn't be sure whether you need this high of a blood flow rate for a patient um, uh, on CRT and sepsis to, to just to do hemoperfusion. Um, that we have higher perfusion or higher blood flow rates in ECMO is just um, because the ECMO pumps at a higher rate. Uh, probably 150 ml to 200 ml per minute are also enough for this patient population, but you cannot, you, you, you cannot actually slow down the blood. You cannot decrease the blood flow to the hemoperfusion uh, cartridge. Um, but uh, talking about dialysis, um, 200 ml, four liters of dialysis um, solution um, are basically what we're um, doing at a maximum. Anything other than that is not really um, feasible um, or, or good in, in CRT. Let's see. Uh, why patients of other rates shouldn't be considered major maker in this type of device? Well, because these patients have, of course, um, um, I'm, I'm not saying you shouldn't look at uh, mortality. Um, however, uh, that would be of course facetious to say, of course you want our patients to survive. However, just as uh, using um, uh, any acute intervention, the first step in this acute intervention is solution of shock. And then in, in, in this very sick patient population, you have a lot of confounders for death. And uh, just to be facetious, uh, what if uh, your patient just then has a stroke in week three? That is completely independent of uh, uh, hemoperfusion he got in week one on day two and three, um, uh, where his uh, septic shock got better and where his kidneys started working again and his ARDS got better. However, he developed AFib in week three uh, you didn't you didn't see it, you didn't anticoagulate. He uh, was unfortunate and died of a stroke. So what I'm saying is, of course, mortality matters and mortality matters in a short or medium term, like 30 day mortality, and it matters in a long, like three, six, one year survival. Um, however, the device itself cannot be aimed at reducing one year's mortality. If that ha happens to be so great, the device itself is aimed or is aiming at reducing organ failure, which is an acute intervention in the ICU. And you're just hoping that reducing the severity of organ failure, avoiding increased organ failure will lead to better survival. Um, and in the end, you will need trials looking at survival and looking at wh whether mortality um, or, or hemoperfusion is an independent predictor of improved mortality. For that, you need a trial with several hundred patients because what is the effect size? We don't really know. Does it reduce mortality by 5%, by 10%, by 30%? If it reduces mortality by 10%, you will have, uh, you're talking about hundreds of patients to be included um, who spend lots of time in the SU with a lot of potential confounders in their disease, in their treatment. So that's a really hard to consider endpoint. That's what makes critical care trials so hard and makes it so different, for example, from I'm a cardiology by a cardiologist by profession, from cardiology trials outside of critical care where um, the event rates um, and, and confounding factors are much better controllable. How do you measure the hemoprene blood flow when you're connecting ECMO? Well, we only did this initially. We don't do this regularly. Initially, we had a setup where we actually, you know, kind of put an, a larger tube, tubing part in between where we could measure flow with a, a, a flow meter uh, that we usually then uh, that we usually use for distal leg perfusion in VA ECMO. So it's not something we do regularly. We did it initially to actually get a feeling about uh, how much blood flow we are um, getting through the hemoperfusion filter when we have it hooked up with an ECMO machine. So any other questions? I hope I 
could satisfy your, uh, your, your questions with my answers. All right. I don't see any other open questions. I think I addressed everything that had been put into the chat. Uh, there's one more. So is it necessary to test the hemoperfusion blood flow rate when connecting? <laughs> no. I think you can be, um, in, a, in a regular setup, your blood flow on ECMO is high. You're probably doing fine with 150 ml per minute blood flow through a hemoperfusion device. Um, so you don't need to actually test that in advance. Um, we would just did that for um, out of interest because there was no data really available or bedside data available, what the blood flow rate would be if you hook it up to uh, a, a, a Nova Lung or um, from a Mackay ECMO machine um, in a veno venous um, patient. Um, because there was no data, we measured it ourselves and um, that's the answer we got. Um, but I don't think it needs to be recommended for general use. Thank you, Dr. Krista. I think you are very clear with all the question and the presentation. Um, now I will um, show uh, music for everyone the end of this, this brilliant lecture. <laughs> <laughs>